Hey folks, T here and relax, sit back. This video is gonna probably be kind of long. Uh, as you know, I recently did my Wii vs. GameCube video. Um, went over pretty well. A lot of people seem to enjoy it. Um, you know, when you make that kind of video, you don't, you're not able to get out every point you'd like to get out because you have to edit and stuff. So some things I, that I put in, you know, in the video, I actually had to edit out to make it, you know, more cohesive. And so that's what we're doing today. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into my likes and dislikes uh, of the GameCube. I'm going to also do one for the Wii as well. So we're going to dive in a little bit deeper and discuss the GameCube and, uh, it's going to be pretty informal, so welcome to my uh, evening with GameCube. <laughs> uh, relax and, uh, you know, let's, let's talk GameCube. So, obviously, if you watched that video, if you haven't watched it, please go watch it. My Wii vs. GameCube video for my new series, Versus. Uh, I talk about, um, I basically, I pit two different things together. In that episode, it was Wii and the GameCube. And I came in with a bias <laughs> uh, initially because my perspective was that we was better. And for every versus, I'm not going to do that. But this one specifically, I did that because, you know, the narrative is that the Wii was, you know, just just some, you know, uh, casual console. You know, it was made for grandmas and soccer uh, moms and things of that nature. And it didn't have... You know, those it didn't have the great game lineup and whatnot. And I was hoping to dispel that. And uh, and that's why I came in with the bias that the GameCube uh, was not as good. But I mean, I'm going to talk about the good things of the GameCube and some, you know, more of the things that um, what I felt hurt the GameCube during its era. And so that's what we're going to do here. Obviously, this is my Platinum GameCube. Um, this is not my first GameCube. I got this a little bit later. My actual day one GameCube is right here, the purple bad boy. Platinum one out of the way. This purple one here is uh, my day one GameCube that I got from Walmart. Um, and then I I was working at Walmart at the time, and like I said, I uh, uh, got my discount and I quit. <laughs> and this is the GameCube here, as you can see. Um, uh, very. I make fun of the design of the game because I just think it's just kind of, it's a cube, obviously, and that was kind of a part of the gimmick, and so was this uh, handle on the back, you know, supposedly so you can carry it around to uh, a friend's house or just carry it around the house, you know, and I just thought that was a weird design choice, and get the four control ports and your two memory card slots, and uh, here we go with the open jack button, or open lid button power button here and uh, your reset button and uh, this is a very sturdy sturdy console um, I will say that so that is a plus um, and this is like I said this is my day one GameCube still and it works like a dream it works perfect so obviously that is an awesome thing and uh, so we're just going to talk about basically um, my, some of my issues with it, obviously, uh, you, you have all these expansion slots that were never used. Um, although one was, I believe this is the one for the modem right here. No, no, that's not it. That is actually for the Game Boy Player, which I talked about before. You can play your Game Boy Advance games. Uh, I'm in trouble with this. Here's where the modem goes. You could get a dial-up modem or a Ethernet. Um, with it right there and there. So, but there's only like, what, I think two games in the Fantasy Star Online games that use it. And you know, Nintendo has done this before with other consoles. They have all these expansion ports. Let's see if I can grab. Uh, here's my Super Nintendo. Um, and it also has an extension port on the bottom of it that wasn't really used, at least not here. Um, and, you know, it's used for a multitude of things. Maybe just developers use it or whatnot. So, there's that. And uh, here's another console with an expansion slot. Uh, this was actually used in Japan uh, for the N64. That was for the disk drive, the 64DD, which we never got here. And I'll talk about that in another video, I guess. 
So, you know, GameCube, but the problem is the GameCube came out of an era where uh, consoles were using uh, online multiplayer. The Dreamcast had done it before um, and was doing it at the time the GameCube came out. And the uh, Xbox original and the PlayStation 2 were uh, online uh, game, uh, game consoles. So for them not to really dive in was, you know, not a good thing. And here you have your, uh, your AV analog out, your digital AV in. Um, this is actually one of the consoles that actually still have that. And this is your power adapter uh, slot. Uh, AV gave you uh, 480p. If you got the cables, the special cables, um, right now I think they cost two hundred dollars. So good luck with that. Uh, the best thing is to do to do is to play your GameCube games in your Wii and use the component cables for that because they're way cheaper. Or use a uh, let's see if I can reach it here a uh, Wii two H uh, Wii two HDMI. Uh, this goes into your AV slot in the back and has. HDMI out and it works perfectly. It's great. You get a nice signal, nice clean. If you're capturing stuff, it's great for that. So, all right, let's talk about some games here. Um, some of my disappointments, um, and I'll tell you why I found them disappointing for the most part. But uh, Star Fox Assault was one of them. Uh, this was a game I believe was uh, not co developed, but I think completely developed by Namco. They handed it off. Nintendo did hand it uh, Star Fox off to Namco, and uh, so we got uh, this game, which wasn't quite there. You know, it, was, it just didn't quite do what I think it wanted to do. So that's one. Uh, Mario Sunshine um, was a big disappointment. A lot of people like Mario Sunshine. I understand that uh, there are things to love about Mario Sunshine, but you know, this is just part of what hurt the GameCube for me. Um, it's disjointed, confused nature, not really knowing what uh, what it wanted to be. And Mario Sunshine was a rushed game. Believe it or not, Nintendo had to rush this game out to meet its uh, August uh, 2002 uh, deadline. And uh, they actually cut, uh, I believe, five worlds. Um, at least they had five worlds planned they had to cut from this game. And that's why you get that blue coin nonsense <laughs> which I can't stand because they just throw blue coins everywhere nondescriptly in this game and they had to pad the length of the game basically with the blue coin crap so um, you know and the setting of it it's only in tropical so you didn't hit, have the variety that you should get from Mario games Mario worlds and things of that nature so that was kind of disappointing um, there's a game that wasn't disappointing this is actually Rose Squadron 3 which I love um, both Rogue Squadron games I have them um, and I love Rogue Squadron series the graphics are beautiful 60 frames per second beautiful graphics and uh, amazing sound uh, it felt like you were a pilot uh, or a character in Star Wars this is one of the best Star Wars games out there um, Star Fox Adventures again this game is another game that felt rushed it felt like oh rare we're on our way out the door <laughs> let's hurry up and finish the Star Fox game and this will be our last game uh, we make for Nintendo so uh, yeah that's you know that's what it felt like it felt like a rush game it's a, a poor man Zelda game um, uh, with beautiful graphics again um, but kind of shallow combat and like and, you know not as good puzzles uh, and dungeons and stuff being fun in the Zelda game and tacked on Star Fox stuff like flying and stuff missions they were not very good at all so I don't think anybody will tell you that the flying stuff in this game is good even the staunchest fans and here we come with another one of those disappointing games uh, Donkey Kong 64 is much maligned now but most people liked it uh, back when it came out actually I have it right here on the N64 there goes my top to it or whatever the for the cover oh, I just dropped it again uh, but yeah anyway Ducky Count 64 um, wasn't a great game but it was a really good game and uh, you know it was a epitome of collectathons and uh, it kind of turned a lot of people off but you know it was still a uh, core Ducky Kong game and uh, I'm just gonna be able to grab it get this 
back out of the way. And Jungle Beat was not. It was a kind of strange game that you control with bongos. Let's see if I can grab my bongos without making a mess here. There we go. Uh, you use the bongos to control your Donkey Kong character. You know, you tap uh, right for right movement. Damn, drop the game. <clears throat> and you tap uh, left for left movement. And uh, there's a speaker. Uh, I forgot what this button. No, this is the start pause button. There's a speaker right here. You can see that. And if you clap, um, I believe clapping was for... Uh, I don't know if it was for jumping or punching or something, but so it would register that, and I think you, uh, I think you jump by tapping both of these at the same time, and then you, you know, run. In this game, you'd be sweating your nads off <laughs> playing it, but you know it's a fun game. But it wasn't like a core Donkey Kong game; it was kind of gimmicky, and it was very, very short. So, you know, mostly disappointing. Um, this this game is greatness. So, nothing bad to say about Paper Mario. Actually, I'm going to do a versus, I think, in the future with Paper Mario uh, 64 and Paper Mario 1000 Year Door. So that should be fun. Donkey Konga, obviously that's a, a specific uh, music game for Donkey Kong, uh, the Kongos. And uh, uh, here's a great game, obviously, from the makers of GoldenEye. Uh, a lot of the core team, I believe it was after Perfect Dark. They left to form Free Radical Design, and Free Radical Design is the creators of the Time Splitter series. And you, I mean, these games feel so much like GoldenEye from N64. It's crazy. But, you know, as much as you want to say, oh, this is a GameCube game, this was also on other consoles, PlayStation 2, uh, I think Xbox is original as well. I don't know. But, you know, so you can't <sighs> attribute its greatness to one console because it was a multiplat. So, uh, here's another game, Wave Race Blue Storm, that, you know, just after the first one, it just felt off. I don't know how else to say it. It has a bit of soullessness to it. It has a bit of uh, almost even rushed feel to it as well. Um, I like the game, but it just wasn't the step I was expecting after uh, the N64 one. So, unfortunately... Um, uh, nothing really bad to say about Mario Kart Double Dash. Uh, I go back and forth on my favorite Mario Karts, and this is always near the top, if, if not the top. Um, Dark Double Dash is a great game. Beautiful, uh, really nice visuals in this game. Uh, I believe the frame rate 60 frames. Um, still a blast to play. The battle mode in it, it's awesome. My favorite battle mode, I think, in all the Mario Kart games. Yeah, we don't really need to talk about that one. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's an okay game, but it's just not a standout, uh, uh, you know, GameCube game. This one is, uh, but it's also on uh, PS2 as well. Beyond Good and Evil, we're actually getting a sequel to it. I couldn't be happier. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy about that. But uh, this is a great game of the sixth gen. Uh, but it wasn't an exclusive, but you know, I obviously I bought it on GameCube. So uh, then you get the SSXs. I missed these types of games. You don't really get them anymore. Um, this is a great time in uh, gaming. Six Gen uh, was I feel like the peak of gaming as far as the creativity and the variety of games we got. Um, and you have the Medal of Honors, um, which uh, aren't really a big franchise anymore. It kind of blew up late in this era and then into 7th gen and Call of Duty just kind of took its thunder took over and uh, EA focused on that and uh, but these were really cool games these were great World War II uh, you know shooters first person shooters obviously uh, you know Naruto Clash and Ninja um, I actually did some gameplay on this a while back um, you know it was cool to get these kinds of games We also has Naruto games fighting games so uh, Sonic Heroes I don't know about Sonic Heroes. I, I, I don't think it was exclusive. I think it was also on PS2. Um, and yeah, this is one of the good third, uh, third person, or not third person, but 3D Sonic games um, that we got. So really good. Um, and I like my platformers on 
uh, GameCube. There were some obscure ones like this, Vex. A lot of people don't remember. I think it got a sequel. I don't have the sequel. Um, I don't think I do anyway. I don't have... A, I'm not going to go through all my games because we'll be here forever. But, um, yeah, I really liked Vex. You know, it was a cool uh, attempt at a uh, mascot uh, platformer. So that was dope. And uh, one of the big things about GameCube is it had this exclusive deal with Capcom where uh, all the Resident Evil games... All right, so my mic just died. Uh, I don't know if I was able to salvage any of that audio. So you may or may not hear a change in quality. Um, that kind of sucks because now I got to buy a new mic. It was a very old mic and it got a lot of use. So, uh, so we're just gonna keep it going. Uh, here is uh, Dragon Ball Z, uh, Budokai. Uh, these were semi-popular games during this generation and somewhat into the next one. 7th Gen, so um, GameCube got those as well. Alright, and here's my some of my favorite stuff on the GameCube. Um, these are also PS2 games. Uh, the Lord of the Rings games from EA. I really miss this EA. This EA had their hands into so many different types of games. And uh, this was a really awesome era in gaming because of that. And unfortunately, we don't have that kind of variety from the big companies anymore they usually stick to you know two maybe three top franchises a year um or you know every couple of years and it's just kind of sad it's kind of sad to see that um all right so here's another one of those capcom games uh through the deal uh they i don't know if i talked about it all but they got all the resident evil games they were um they were uh, uh, remastered. Uh, they were basically remakes on the GameCube from the PS1, and they all look really good. Um, and we're still getting <laughs> these games today because uh, Capcom likes to dip, double dip, triple dip, you know, quadruple dip, and on and on. But it was a, a very inventive game. Uh, had a lot of good ideas. Just the execution of it wasn't that great. Um, but I love the stylized nature of the main character, um, how she kind of dances to the music in the game. It's pretty cool. So it was a great idea, just not fully executed. Um, and here are some of my favorite games. These were exclusives at the time, as you can see, only four. Actually, two when it came out was not exclusive. As you can see, there's no only four on there. And uh, I don't know if one eventually got ported to PS1 as well, but these were some of my favorite games this gen um capcom uh again capcom gave the gamecube a lot of love and uh there was some pretty good games that came out of that so these were great um geist uh came out really late in gamecube's life cycle i actually think it should have been uh, pushed over to the wii and maybe would have got more love but it came out when people had pretty much started to move on to xbox 360 and uh, really diving into their PS2s and stuff. So, uh, yeah, this is a really cool game. This is one of the best exclusives you'll find on the GameCube. And speaking of best exclusives you'll find on the GameCube, you got Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem. Um, I love the atmosphere and the story in this game and the different characters you get to use. Uh, the combat is just kind of weak. Um, it's pretty cool use of magic, but... Uh, that's definitely the weak point is the combat and the level design i guess there wasn't a whole lot there but love the atmosphere of these games this or these games this game melee needs an introduction we all know melee so that's cool uh, final fantasy crystal chronicles i was happy to get this because we hadn't had a final fantasy game on uh nintendo console in quite some time at this point uh this is kind of the chibi art style ish type of game but you know, it was good to have a, a Square Enix RPG on a Nintendo console again, so I was happy to buy it. It's a pretty good game. Uh, Battalion Wars, I love this game. Um, we also got one on Wii, and uh, this is just basically the console version of Advance Wars with some differences. Uh, the combat's more real-time. 
But yeah, it's a pretty good game. I like that a lot. Wind Waker. Um, again, Wind Waker is. Um, I like Wind Waker a lot. Um, it's probably in my top four Zelda games of all time. Uh, but this is another example of the shortcomings of the Wii, or short, shortcomings of the GameCube, I should say, where um, I believe they cut four dungeons from this game um, due to time constraints. And uh, that's why you get that weird Triforce chase at the end. And, you know, it's just stuff like that that happened on GameCube that uh, overall hurt my experience uh, with the GameCube. So uh, we got the illustrious F-Zero GX made by Sega. Um, arguably the best F-Zero game, although it's... Uh, I, you know, I go back and forth between this and F-Zero X and 64 one, so... Um, I may give that one a slight edge, but this one is awesome, beautiful, fast and furious. And I hope the audio doesn't suck. All right, and then we have Courtside. Uh, this is the last Courtside game. Uh, probably, you know, in developed because Nintendo wasn't sure about EA and what they were going to do or they were going to get support. Um, this is the last one. Um, once EA showed that they were going to be around. They quit making these games. This was made by, um, not HAL Laboratories, um, the same studio that made the courtside games on N64. Oh my God, I can't think of their names right now. Let's see if it's on here. Uh, yes, uh, Left Field, Left Field Designs. They also did Excite Byte 64, which I love on the N64. So um, this uh, wasn't that great. <laughs> it felt kind of rushed and, uh, you know, wasn't, you know, that good of a basketball game. It was okay. Uh, you got your Maddens. Oh, I didn't show it. Uh, Madden 06. Um, I was still kind of a Madden guy, but I was moving on to 2K at the time. We got Splinter Cell. Um, I love Splinter Cell. Like, I I always, um, there was always this kind of weird competition between Splinter Cell and Metal Gear Solid. And I was way more of a Splinter Cell guy. Um, cause I, you know, I couldn't deal with all the movies <laughs> that Metal Gear Solid did. This game puts you into the action. I love stealth action games. Um, and, uh, this is for me, the one that got it started. So I know this games like Thief and stuff, PC and stuff, people, people love the Thief games, but for me, it was always Splinter Cell. All right. Spartan Total Warrior. Really like this game. Another Sega game. Um, at least Sega published. I don't know if they developed it or not. I don't think so. No, um, they published it, and uh, this is, I believe, came from the PC. And a really cool, like battle, large-scale battle game with uh, Spartans and warriors of that era. So pretty cool. All-Star Baseball 2002. I like the All-Star Baseball series on N64, but this was definitely a step down. It's so weird that the the basketball courtside Kobe Bryant's courtside and all-star baseball which I thought was stellar on N64 these both kind of fell off I don't know if they just were it was the competition from EA and stuff they just didn't put in as much effort my boy Derek Jeter on the cover uh, the greatest so yeah pretty good game though uh, Sims um, I kind of just like ended up getting the Sims because it was so freaking popular at this time I wasn't like the biggest Sims fan or anything, but it's Sims was so popular in this area, 2002, 2003. And obviously this is a player choice one. So I got this a little later. Um, and I think player's choice minutes sold 500,000 copies or more. So, um, did pretty well robots from the movie RIP Robin Williams, um, dark summit. This was an interesting game. Cause it was kind of like, it's a snowboarding game, but it had like a storyline. It was you know, this kind of plot, you know, on this ski resort or uh, dark summit. And uh, it was pretty cool. It was very different from, you know, SSX was running everything at the time. And this was different. Uh, THQ, <laughs> RIP THQ as well. They're not around anymore. So, uh, well, they've been consumed by a, a, another company. Burnout 2. Oh, man. So many memories with Burnout 2. Uh, one of my favorite racing games ever. 
Um, I used to play this game so much. This is one of the games on GameCube I played a ton of. I love the crash mechanics and all that stuff. This is before I feel like it got corrupted by EA. As you can see, Acclaim made it. And I think EA got it, acquired it for uh, Burnout 3. And Burnout 3 was really good, actually. I did like Burnout 3, but I just felt like it once it you know it got in EA's hands, it kind of lost something. It lost the uniqueness, I guess. And uh, I kind of missed that. But and here's another one of those... You know, clever EA games that came out. They were cool. Um, very interesting. Uh, and, you know, arcade style sports games. Um, very stylized. Um, and this is the EA I miss. EA Big. You know, you got SSX and you got these games. You got NFL Street. And this is, these were pretty cool. This is, again, that era of greatness where you got so much different stuff. Spider Man 2 needs no introduction. Um, probably my favorite Spider-Man game and my favorite Spider-Man movie for sure. This was my favorite superhero movie for a long time um, when it came out. Really loved Spider-Man 2. Um, very cool. Uh, Starsky and Hutch, uh, based on the TV show. I think this came out around the time that movie came out. Um, it's not on the movie. I think it was just trying to capitalize because the movie came out. But uh, yeah, it's a fun driver type of game with the uh, Starsky and Hutch characters and stuff so oh the bond games the bond games and gamecube were pretty good ea did really good job agent on the fire i didn't like it as much because i felt like the 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 bullets were weird like they were slow when you fired they it, it, it just moved they traveled kind of slow and it was just kind of weird um you know i liked it um but i liked um do i have it over here uh yeah i liked it out here i liked this game this bond game the most night fire it felt the most the closest to as far as the multiplayer goes it felt the closest to uh golden eye so i really loved night fire played this way more than anything uh used to really love uh you know blasting it up on uh on a multiplayer uh, obviously it wasn't online. I don't know if the, uh, the PlayStation one is online. I can't remember. I actually have it, but I don't, didn't really play it that much because I was more of a GameCube guy. Um, everything or nothing. This is awesome. Um, it felt like, um, more so than Nightfire. This felt like, uh, it was based on a movie and they actually got, uh, the, the model Heidi Klum, um, who's, a uh, What's that show, that runaway show, that fashion uh, TV show she does with designers and stuff. So you know her from that. She used to be married to Seal, the singer. And uh, this is cool because you got Heidi Klum and you got Shannon Elizabeth from uh, American Pie fame. You know, she played the, uh, I think it was Natalia or whatever from, she's supposed to be like a foreign exchange student or whatever. Um, but she um, is in this and you know, they're basically Bond girls for a Bond movie game that didn't really have a movie, but it was really close to feeling like it did. Um, I did Agent on the Fire already. Um, Prince of Persia, you know, Sands of Time needs no introduction. These games were great in this era. Um, I guess they maybe they oversteered their welcome and it didn't really make the transition to 7th gen. So, uh, X Men Legends, I, I like these games a lot. It felt like uh, RPG-ish type of action games with the X-Men characters. You know, we don't really remember X-Men, though. So says Sony. Uh, not Sony. Uh, so says Capcom with Marvel vs. Capcom, since they're not putting any... See, keep going back to Capcom for some reason. Here's the first Spider-Man game. Not as good as the second one. Uh, not as open, but it was a good game still. Not really any other standouts I want to show you, but you know, the, like I said, the GameCube um, was you know a really good console. Um, it's just not my favorite uh, Nintendo console. Um, it's, I hate to say that it's my least favorite because I still really like it a lot. Um, but I like when Nintendo's being super unique and different and. See if I can find the yeah. Let's bring out the controller here. 
Um, this is one of the best things about the GameCube was the WaveBird controller. And uh, this is like the first real viable uh, wireless controller on consoles uh, that wasn't crap. This thing worked. It felt like it worked one to one. So um, very good controller. Um, and this is so cool because I remember this is the uh, dongle for it. This little knock everything over here. Let's see if I can. Yeah, let's get that uh, better focus there. This little dongle here is for it, and I was gonna plug it up. I just didn't feel like going through all that. But it's funny because you, you move the stick or you press a button or whatever, and you, you got to set the dial here. Let me move this up. As you can see, for maybe some people who don't know. About the WaveBird controller, so it had all these channels on it, kind of like a walkie-talkie, and you could just pick. You know, if you were getting interference, you could just change it on here, and then you'd go, you know, and match it up over here on this dial. And uh, once you did that, and you knew you had the right channel, uh, there's a little light. So I took this Samus sticker that I got in game, uh, Nintendo Power, and I position like her visor right over the light so when I move it looks like her visor is lighting up so I wanted to show maybe I'll show it later in the video um, but I always thought that was pretty cool and I remember the day I did that so it's kind of funny um, I actually need to bring this back up here because I talked about it before but here is the Game Boy player here at the bottom um, let you play Game Boy Advance and regular Game Boy games. Let me see if I can fix this. Focus. Let's bring it up closer. Get a better look at it up here. All right, there's Dynasty Warriors still in there. I haven't played Game Boy Player in a while, so that's why it's still in there from my last video. So there's that. Uh, let's. It's cool because the Game Boy Player actually had the link cable uh, that would let you link up two Game Boys together. So it had the link cable uh, extension or the link cable port. And you can probably, you could, I never did it, but you could go from your Game Boy Player to a Game Boy and link them up. And that would be kind of cool. So, um, so as you can see, that's what the extender on the bottom was used for. And here is the actual disc for the Game Boy Player. It's required, so you got to have that disc. So if you're out and you see a Game Boy Player, um, you better make sure it comes with that disc because you can't use the Game Boy Player without it. But if you see the disc somewhere by itself, grab that disc because they're getting harder and harder to find together with the Game Boy Player. So that's a bit of advice for you there. Let's put the GameCube back over here. So, yeah, I just wanted to actually quickly run down uh, things that maybe I'll put the graphic up on screen so you don't just stand at the GameCube this whole time but um, I just wanted to go over the things that were issues to me for the GameCube and kept it from being one of my top uh, games um, actually PM Prime uh, uh, he used to be a YouTuber Tony Rendy he used to YouTube videos and stuff and uh he still watches obviously and he left a comment and the comment was so close to my feelings about the gamecube i was like i gotta read this i gotta have this in so i'm just gonna read his comment right now and it says uh, my problem with the gamecube is that nintendo's offerings other than f-zero metroid mario double cart uh mario double dash and uh mario kart double dash and smash brothers melee were either better on the n64 or surpassed later by the wii or wii u um and i think that was my biggest thing with the gamecube out of everything is that coming from the n64 which i felt had so many great classics on it the gamecube just never got to that point it you know to be on par with it well, let me keep reading um you mentioned he's talking about a video that I did and uh, so he's saying you mentioned Wave Race I love Wave Race 64 but Blue Storm felt fell off for some reason he felt the same way that it fell off uh, same thing with 1080 snowboarding of which I forgot to mention um, I played Star Fox 64 to death 
the game the two GameCube offerings were meh. I liked Wind Waker, but I didn't love it. Like Ocarina of Time or Twilight Princess, Sunshine is still the only 3D Mario game where I haven't collected every single thing I can possibly get, and I, I'm in the same boat. I didn't, I never 100% it. Uh, Sunshine because it was just too tedious to me, especially with the blue coins. Or right, we stop talking and finish reading this thing. I devour 3D Mario like Galactus and Unicorn combined, or Unicorn, Unicron combined. He's a big, if you don't know Tony Rennie, PM Prime. He's a big Transformers guy. So. Um, uh, where's it? Or my, uh, like Unicron combined, but I had my fill of sunshine after only 60 or so shines, shine sprites. He's talking about the star, basically the bare minimum rare was also getting ready to get the boot and their output decreased in quality and quantity. And Ducky Kong got the shaft with those damn bungos, which I showed you guys earlier, although not uh, although not from Nintendo, the wrestling games from THQ weren't the same either. I thought I was just getting old and tired of games in general at the time, but the Wii brought everything back for me with a new perspective, and I totally agree with him on that. And so did Sean Long. I think Sean Long in my video mentioned the fact that the game, uh, the Wii brought him back to hardcore gaming, which which would blow some people's mind, the Wii, but yet, um, the same thing happened with me. To continue on what he's saying here, the Wii U is very close uh, to the GameCube in my heart, and it's a toss-up of which one I believe is better. I can go either way at any given time. GameCube had Rogue Leader, Eternal Darkness, Resident Evil 4, Spider-Man 2, Soul Calibur 2, Ikaruga, and everything or nothing, so it wasn't really lacking in game in the games front. It's just the drop-offs were too noticeable for me at the time, and I think he's talking about drop-offs from N64 to the GameCube, and I totally agree. Uh, one of the big things about N64 was Rare, and uh, all those great Rare games we got, and uh, we lost Rare during the GameCube era, right after Star Fox Adventures. Um, um, if you remember Cameo, Elements of Power was supposed to be a Rare, uh, was supposed to be a, a GameCube game, and ended up on like the 360, I believe. And uh, so it was just a drop off. It was just a drop off from N64 as far as the classic games, a classic feel goes to uh, GameCube. And I think that was the biggest, my biggest issue with it. So I'm just gonna quickly go down my list of things. Weird Luigi launch title at, uh, at launch instead of a major 3D Mario platformer. We had, that. the GameCube was the first console Nintendo put out that didn't have a 3D, or not a 3D, but a main Mario game. So, uh, launching Mario in the summer with the limited world. I mentioned that before. All island warm climate themed without your typical varied levels and giving him a lame water jetpack thing, which I, you know, got old for me pretty quickly. Uh, the bad camera and un Nintendo like controls. And, uh, you know, Sunshine to me was not a polished, you know, effort from Nintendo. So, uh, that I was used to getting at that point. Uh, letting Rare go to Microsoft, which they could have easily stopped with a stock buyout. I go back and forth on this. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I hear that Nintendo could have easily just bought a 51% stake in Rare and kept them, um, but they didn't. Maybe I'll talk about that in another video once I do more research. Uh, next one is handing off God tier Star Fox to Namco, who clearly didn't understand the franchise. And I think they got some things right. They got a lot of things right in Star Fox, but they just didn't get quite get the feel of Star Fox right. Um, investigating or investing in Pac-Man versus and making GameCube games that required uh, GBAs to function as as intended, and uh, that was a weird thing. They put a, they did a big thing at E3 uh, with Pac-Man versus, so it wasn't like there was just some side thing. Miyamoto co-developed Pac-Man versus, which uh, ironically enough just came out on. Uh, the Namco uh, collection for Switch. And uh, so that's kind of weird. Um, making and selling an internet modem that only worked for two Sega games. Uh, that's egregious. <laughs> Turning down GTA and accepting true crime. <laughs> streets of LA and uh, streets in New York or something, I think it's called. Um, failure to adequately promote games like Eternal Darkness, Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes, and Geist. 
which I mentioned earlier, turning a premier platforming franchise, Donkey Kong, into a somewhat shallow bungle controller-based gimmick, um, creating a DVD-based GameCube for Japan only. That was so unnerving. Um, obviously, it costs more. It was more expensive. Um, I actually want to get that thing in my collection. I'll show a picture of it here. Um, but yeah, the in Japan, they got a Panasonic GameCube which played DVDs and it was pretty cool looking and um, we never got that here. It was just one of those things that Nintendo didn't feel like we, I think that thing would have sold way more. I think GameCube would have sold way more had we got that, that uh, Panasonic one. Uh, none of the, here's another one. None of the, none of that has anything to do with Microsoft Xbox entering the ring. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, the, uh, the GameCube didn't sell well because of Microsoft. And to some degree, that's true, but the things I mentioned had nothing to do with Microsoft, and I think these those things hurt it. Um, um, what's next? I said, uh, oh, okay, I think I'm just kind of, yeah, so that's, that's it. That's it for, yeah, that stuff. So, yeah, so like I said, I like the GameCube a lot. Um, it just didn't quite get there for me. Um, didn't quite do it for me as a Nintendo console, as far as the uniqueness that I expect, you know, especially coming off of this bad boy. Um, the GameCube didn't quite do it for me, but yeah, as you can see, I have three of them, uh, and two of them I did buy during the GameCube era. I bought the platinum one here, and uh, if you see my original, where did I put it? My original uh, purple one. I can't believe I misplaced it. Oh, there it is. Original purple GameCube. Yeah, my original purple GameCube, uh, day one GameCube. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's. I just wanted to share this and get more intimate about the GameCube and you know what I thought were its faults and you know its weaknesses and its strengths and. Uh, that was uh, what I wanted to do. I actually, oh, let me just quickly touch on this again because I did touch on it a little bit in the video, but you know, let's just quickly do this. This, you know, is a very uh, focus better here. It's a very comfortable controller. A lot of people love this controller for its comfort, but man, like that D pad is just a joke. <laughs> this is, I think, this is a Game Boy Advance D pad. Uh, they just threw on here. It's not very good. And I mean, why the yellow nub for analog? I think this is just, oh, we're doing dual analog, but we're gonna be different about it, you know? The, but it's not, this, this was basically your second analog stick for looking around and whatnot. And this weird, while comfortable, weird bean shape situation uh, wasn't good for a lot of games, mostly fighters. Um, it's a weird setup for fighters and whatnot, but um, and no oh boy, this uh, this is like the worst button ever created. That Z button, they just it seemed like they tried to bring the N64 into a more modern traditional controller setup. And it was like, oh, we we have this Z button left over. Remember the trigger button from the N64? Well, let's just throw it up there. There's some room, <laughs> and it didn't quite work out. A squishy start button, but you barely use that, so it's not a big deal. But you know, it's, it's a comfortable, comfortable controller. It just wasn't quite uh, what I expected coming off the N64 controller, which I thought was super innovative and cool. So, yeah, I mean, that's it. Uh, let me know what you guys think uh, about the intimate evening with GameCube here. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this or not. Um, what are some of your memories of the GameCube? Um, is it one of your favorite consoles? Is it your favorite Nintendo console or console period? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you as always for watching and listening and I'll see you boos next time. Peace out. Oh yeah, one more thing. Play Nintendo, fools!